Have Ways of Making You Talk presents The Cauldron by Zeno, read by Al Murray. Chapter 14. Bridgman lay in the rubble to one side of the crossroads in Ustabik, staring up the road to the west. The CO joined him. I'm afraid you can't wait much longer, Alan. If they haven't come through in another five minutes, you'll have to take up your new positions without them. I'll send them on to you as soon as they arrive. If they haven't joined us in five minutes, they won't be coming, sir. Jordan said nothing. He knew Bridgman was right. Whatever trouble Blake and his men had run into would either be solved at first light or it would not be solved at all. The bulk of the platoon lay out of sight behind the two officers. The night spent within the divisional perimeter had given most of them their first night's rest since they landed. In front of Bridgman was a Spandau and to his right was a Bren group which Gorman had joined a few minutes earlier. Jordan knew that Bridgman had been waiting all night for the section to come through and he knew exactly how the platoon commander was feeling. Bridgman cocked his head suddenly, listened intently. Jordan strained his ears and cursed the partial deafness he had concealed from the medics for so long. What is it, Alan? What can... The remainder of Jordan's words were lost in the unheralded roar which broke out to the south of them. To Jordan it seemed as if every calibre of gun in the German army was firing. Interspersing the muzzle blasts of the guns and the crash of the bursting shells, he could hear the chatter of German machine guns and the slower reply of the Brens as the border regiment opened fire. Jordan had looked instinctively in the direction of the firing, although he knew he would be able to see nothing. Now he looked back at Bridgman. The subaltern hadn't moved except to raise the spandau to his shoulder. Jordan bent close to him and shouted in his ear, "'What did you hear, Alan?' Before that bloody lot started up, I heard an engine out there somewhere. I think it was a jeep. Blake may be warming it up. Bridgman kept his eyes staring ahead while he was talking. Following the direction of his gaze, Jordan saw the wide open road, its surface littered with the debris of war, garden gates hanging drunkenly in front of window-shattered houses, the stillness contrasting strongly with the noise of the battle being fought to the south of them. The jeep came out from between two of the houses so fast that it was in the road and turned in the direction of the waiting officers before Jordan grasped that Blake and his men were making their bid to rejoin the company. The jeep was nearly a hundred yards up the road and as it accelerated towards them Jordan saw that Blake had loaded the whole section onto the vehicle and was relying on surprise combined with the speed of the jeep to carry him into the company lines. Bridgman and Gorman opened fire together, putting long bursts into the houses which marked the turn in the road, the obvious ones for the enemy to occupy. The jeep raced towards them, swerving erratically as it came on, the men clinging to its exterior and being tossed about like rag dolls in a high wind. Then the jeep was past them and turning behind the cover of houses, and as it swept by, Jordan made out the set, tense face of Marsden clinging to the side of the jeep with one hand, while he held on to a wounded man with the other. Blake was standing up alongside the driver, his legs braced, and as he swayed he fired bursts from a schmeisser over the heads of the men crouching in the back of the jeep. Bridgman shouted to Gorman, and leaping to his feet he grabbed the spandau with one hand and Jordan's arm with the other, pulling the CO with him over the few yards which separated them from the cover of a house. In the house they paused long enough to watch Gorman slip through a gate and fall back parallel with them. Beyond the crossroads, Gorman and the two men with him dashed across and joined the remainder of the platoon. Tim Jordan led them all down the road running south to the Rhine. About 50 yards down he halted and turned to Bridgman. Take up a defensive position in the area of this school. He pointed to a long single storied building on the left of the road. He lowered his voice. It's fairly temporary. I'll be moving you farther to the south as soon as I can get Gordon and his men down here. You'd better not let your chaps know they're moving again. They're pretty tired as it is and they won't make much of defensive positions if they realise they're preparing them for someone else. Bridgman nodded. One of the best things about Jordan was the trust he showed in his junior commanders. Too many commanding officers wanted to cite every post of the unit, worrying themselves where individual riflemen should be dug in. Jordan stayed long enough to indicate the link with his own headquarters and to point out the ominous size of the gap between themselves and the scratch forces who held positions between the company and the Lonsdale force down by the river. Bridgman got his platoon into the cover of the school and taking his section commanders with him, he carried out a reconnaissance of the immediate area. He made it as thorough as he could, for he was convinced there would be no further contraction of the perimeter. From now on, units would stand or fall in roughly the positions they were now in. Bridgman reckoned he had only a few uninterrupted hours at the most. When the Germans in the centre of the town found there was nothing immediately in front of them, they would edge forward cautiously, probing the area in front of them until they came up against resistance. 
The last elements of 1st Brigade and of the South Staffs had fallen back during the night and taken up defensive positions under the command of Major Lonsdale in the south. These positions ran northwards from the Rhine, past Oosterbeek Church and finished some 300 yards short of the school occupied by Bridgman and his platoon. In between, immediately south of the Independent Company, lay a composite platoon from 4th Power Brigade headquarters and below them a detachment of the RESC. The country in front of these last two detachments was fairly open, but nevertheless they constituted a very weak force to hold a front of such length. The road on which the school lay was one of the two secondary roads which came together some 60 yards north of the school. Where they joined, Jordan had his headquarters in a large house. The second of the two roads ran parallel to that held by Allen and his platoon. It ran inside the perimeter and joined two of the buildings being used by the division as hospitals. Farther to the west, beyond the interior road, lay open ground, then the tennis courts into which had been packed the German prisoners of war, and, on the far side of the tennis courts, the Hartenstein Hotel and divisional headquarters. North of the crossroads, Ramsden and his men faced east, on roughly the same line as Allen and his men. On the crossroads itself, facing into the independent company headquarters, was the Vreywick Hotel, the most northerly of the hospitals, and east of it, on the road into Arnhem, was what was left of the 10th Power Battalion, all that stood between the hospital and the Germans. Allen left one section digging in in the extensive gardens beyond the school, and the other two sections preparing the building itself for siege. He put a screen of riflemen in front of the men digging, and handing over the platoon to Blake, he set out with O'Neill to investigate the gap on his right flank. Thirty yards south of the school, a secondary road ran east towards Arnhem, but it ran for only a little under a hundred yards before making a sharp turn to the right. This was unguarded, and must become an obvious line of approach for the enemy. Twenty yards beyond the junction, formed by the two roads, the one on which the school stood made a slight twist first to the left and then to the right, but it was sufficient to prevent them from covering the road from their present positions. At this point the interior road was some forty yards to the west, and joined by a brick wall over ten feet high. This formed the base of a triangle, with the house which held Jordan's headquarters at the apex where the two roads joined. Bridgman and O'Neill walked across the gardens parallel with the wall and looked across the inside road at the positions round General Urquhart's headquarters in the Hartenstein Hotel. Farther to the west, the Border Regiment and the 9th RE Field Company faced towards Amsterdam. The perimeter was very narrow. At mid-morning, Brown arrived with his platoon and took over the school from Allen. Bridgman gave the details of his reconnaissance to Jordan, and when the CO left to return to his headquarters, it had been decided that Bridgman's platoon was to sidestep until his right flank rested on the twist in the road and the wall which cut back above the lower hospital. Allen gave much thought to the sighting of his section posts. He felt a great certainty that these were the final positions. In the positions he now selected, his platoon would fight its last fight. There would be no withdrawal, there was nowhere to withdraw to, they would either hold out here in this corner of Oosterbeek or they would be overrun and wiped out. Except for a short period in the big house, Murray's section had been held a reserve in a counter-attack role for the whole of the action. Allen realised that this could not continue. It was the best rested section and of its original 12 members, eight still remained. Its four casualties had all occurred on the second day and it had lost only one NCO. Allen was using O'Neill as a runner but the section was seven strong without him. Of Blake's original section, there was only himself, Lance Corporal Cobbled, Ewing and Bignall. Since midday on the fourth day, Blake had had Marsden's section under command, and this was now reduced to Marsden himself, Hudson, Laverty, McGrath, Adams and Chambers. The two sections combined numbered only ten out of their original twenty-four, and in addition, they had had to bear the brunt of most of the fighting. Gorman had six men, including himself. Allen put Murray's section in the right-hand corner house on the secondary road running east from the company position and also in the house immediately above it. The farther house to cover the road approach, the corner house, the open ground in front of the composite platoon from 4th Brigade HQ. Gorman's section he put into two houses on the inside of the road on which the school stood. This enabled the section to cover all parts of the approach road up to the point where it turned away to the right. Blake and Marsden's men he put in two much bigger houses on the rear of the two roads. If Murray and Gorman were overrun, they would still be a force between the enemy and divisional headquarters. Dwyer, the wireless operator, he left with Blake at the place where he would theoretically have his own headquarters. 
Leaving the men preparing his defences, Bridgman and O'Neill went methodically through the houses in their sector, noting which of them still held Dutch people in their cellars, which contained water in buckets or baths, and which food. The houses facing east had no cellars, but the ones held by Blake had large ones, and these were packed with Dutch civilians. The Dutch were quiet, resigned and eager to cooperate. They realised they would be in the way above ground, and that in the circumstances they could render no better service than to keep out of harm's way and not embarrass the British soldiers by movement about the positions. At one o'clock in the afternoon, Brown's platoon opened fire and Allen, who was with Gorman's section, first lit a cigarette and then looked towards the section commander. Gorman smiled back, his lips turned down and one eyebrow raised quizzically. This was it. Not the end, but the beginning of the end. The hand of the German army had closed until it was gripping the division on every front. How much force would be required to squeeze the airborne men out of existence, they had yet to find out. Bridgman slipped out from Gorman's position and made his way behind the houses until he was at the back of the school on the opposite side of the road. He waited until O'Neill was alongside him and then they both dashed quickly across the narrow road and climbed through a window to join Brown. Gorman stood behind the two men at the table in the first floor bedroom. The table was back in the centre of the room and behind earth-packed sacks and pillowcases rested a Piat and a Bren gun, and behind the weapons, Lance Corporal Summers and Woodley. They looked out onto the 80 yards of open road which ran away from them until it turned sharply to the right. Where it turned, three red-brick Dutch houses stared blankly back at them. Sooner or later, the Germans must occupy those houses. They were probably parallel with them already, opposite Brown and his men. Your ears are more important than anything now. Gorman spoke quietly, his voice impersonal, as if he were thinking of other things. Keep them pinned back for any sound of armoured movement. To come down this road, they first to get to that corner. He nodded his head to the east. I should think they'll patrol first. I'm going over to see Murray to see if we can't fix up some sort of tank trap between us. We need to take a short break now. I'll see you in a tick. Welcome back to Zeno's The Cauldron. Neither of the men spoke for some minutes after he left them. Each was busy with his own thoughts. Woodley spoke first, but first he glanced surreptitiously at the Lance Corporal. Summers was an odd one, all right. He should have been an officer. Woodley knew he'd been to OCTU early in the war, but for some reason had not been commissioned. No one knew why, although there had been plenty of conjecture and a few comic and wild guesses. Generally, it had been put down to booze. Summers drank a lot, and it showed in his face. Not in the obvious ways, but his thick, protuberant lower lip hung always slightly open and his rather prominent eyes remained vacant when other men's lighted up. He was friendly with everybody and nobody. When in billets, he never refused an invitation to join other men for a drink or a party, but he never originated anything. If nobody suggested anything, he simply went out and drank on his own. He was nearly 30 and therefore older than anyone else in the platoon except Sergeant Nash. The sudden recollection of the platoon sergeant brought Woodley up with a jerk. Wonder what happened to old Jim Nash, he asked, absently, as if he didn't really expect an answer. Bought it, I suppose. Either that or wounded and taken prisoner. What made you suddenly think of Jim? Don't know, just thinking. It doesn't pay to think about the others. The casualties, I mean. When you're hit, you're out of it. You're not only out of it, you're a bloody nuisance to your own people, if you haven't been captured. We should all be issued with hemlock, and the moment we're no longer effective, we should be expected to take it. Summers raised the Bren to his shoulder, squinted through the sights, and then lowered the butt onto the blanket-covered table. That, he went on in a quasi-theatrical voice, would be a rather grand way of dying. Woodley looked at the Lance Corporal again sharply. Just one word, and the way in which it had been said, had suddenly opened his eyes. Summers was queer. Woodley blushed as he realised that a man he had known and soldiered with for years was a homosexual. He busied himself moving pier bombs into a handier position. He wondered why he had not guessed it before, and if any of the others had. His mind wandered back over past incidents, seeking some clue he should have seen but missed. In civilian life, Woodley was a musician, and in the course of his work he had encountered hundreds of queers, but he had always known soon after meeting them that they were queer. The majority of them had made no attempt to conceal it. Either Summers was a bloody good actor... Or he was a non-practising homosexual. Woodley stood up. She not be a tick, he said, just going for a leak. He left the room without looking at Summers. He felt angry. Not because Summers was queer, not because the NCO had deceived him, but because he had so successfully deceived them all for so long. 
Woodley felt that it was somehow not right for a man to be so different without other people being aware of it. It took all the certainty and security out of life. It made you feel that you never knew what you were going to discover next. Christ! Summers might even make advances. Woodley clattered down the stairs, the noise he made, an unconscious barrier thrown up between Summers and himself. As Woodley left the room, Summers half turned and watched him over his shoulder. He winced at the noise the soldier made, guessing the reason that prompted it. He looked at the empty road and shared its loneliness. He resisted the temptation to make a physical demonstration of his misery to himself. He had spent too many hours of his life with shaking shoulders and sob-wracked chest, but he conceded a little to his unhappiness. He lowered his head on his crossed wrists and breathed deeply. Since puberty he had lived alone, completely alone, cut off from his fellows not because of his queerness, but because of his refusal to communicate it to others. Fate had decreed that he should be different. He had decided that he should live without the sympathy of understanding. Now that Woodley knew, he could not expect anything from him except an uncomfortable awareness, an unspoken shared knowledge of Summers' difference, which from now on would make every moment they spent alone together embarrassing to both. Woodley stood in the garden buttoning his flies. There was now no firing on Three Platoon's front, but fighting was going on to the north where he believed the recce squadron to be, and there was intermittent fire from one of the border companies, and from the area held by Lonsdale Force. Woodley fingered the black stubble of his beard. He had a thin face with hollow cheeks, and now it seemed that only thin skin lay between his dirty fingertips and the curve of his cheekbones. God, he was tired. He screwed up his eyes and stared across at the two big houses held by Blake and thought he saw a movement behind one of the windows. He shrugged and turned back, looking in at the room below their own, where Cummings had barricaded himself behind a captured Spandau. They exchanged a few words and then, leaving the other soldier to his solitary vigil, Woodley climbed up the stairs to rejoin Summers. He paused for a moment outside the bedroom, trying to forgive Summers for something the Lance Corporal could not help. It was the tiredness, the bone-bloody weariness which was slowly breaking down their resistance. Physical exhaustion had caught Summers off guard, and for one second his facade of normality had slipped. Woodley hoped he had not betrayed his discovery to the other man by his manner. He would try to pretend that he had noticed nothing. He opened the door and went in. Summers was sitting in exactly the same position as he had been when Woodley left him, his left hand grasping the butt of the bren, his right elbow resting on the table, and his hand turned inwards with the knuckles uppermost, his chin resting lightly on the back of his fingers. At once, Woodley thought how odd it was. Most men would have turned their hand and arrested their chin firmly in the cupped palm. It was going to be difficult to forget. Gorman found Murray in the father of the two houses which were his responsibility. McEwen was in the one behind him, the corner house, the southern side of which looked out towards the open ground in front of the 4th Brigade headquarter platoon. He found a scowling, bad-tempered Murray who muttered and swore as he moved from room to room. Nothing was right. He had no field of fire. To the north he could only see through the narrow gaps between the houses on the opposite side of the road and he could see only two of the three houses at the road's end. The south was covered by McEwen in the house behind him. Gorman waited till the Belfast sergeant had finished blowing off steam. It's a bastard, John, but there's one thing about this sort of position. It's as hard for them to get at you as it is for you to move out if you wanted to. You can get back to us just, but apart from that, you're strictly limited. But of course, you limit them too. How could they get you out unless they brought tanks up to the front door? The houses that block your view prevent them from advancing towards you. The road's covered by my chaps as well as yours, and three platoon neutralises the back of the houses on the other side of the road. I reckon your position's pretty good, as long as we can stop them getting armour down to you. That's what I really came to see you about. What can we fix up? With this problem simplified to this basic one, Murray unwound and began to speak with authority. Presently Gorman returned to his own section, satisfied that Murray would be all right. He was already getting to work preparing a similar tank trap to the one they had so successfully put into effect on the third day. Gorman went into the second of his two houses, the one which held only Mocock and Lydon. Both men were behind a Spandau, and as he entered the room, they threw him a quick glance and they resumed their watch on their front. Gorman sat down and smoked a cigarette without speaking to either of them. The situation was bad, but even so he thought there was too much tenseness. He sensed it here with Mocock and Lydon, and he had sensed it with Summers and Woodley. One of you two had better rest, he said. You can't both sit indefinitely staring out of a window. We might be here for days yet. One of you will have to stay with the gun while the other one rests. I'm going to join Cummings and work turn and turn about with him. You two do the same. 
The two soldiers looked woodenly at him, and then at each other. Lydon, who was behind the gun, jerked his head at his companion, eased his shoulders in the crosswebs of his equipment, and resumed his watch. Mocock rolled over and sat with his back against the wall. Days? Don't tell me you think we can hold on for days, Sarge. Mocock's flat Yorkshire vowels turned the negation of a question into something positive. He, they could come through us any time they liked, like a dose of salts. Couldn't they, Sarge? Gorman started to deny the possibility, then changed his mind. These men weren't just private soldiers. They were good soldiers, and they were his friends. You'd think so, Tom, but they don't. What's true now has been true since 4th Brigade caught their packet and fell back into the divisional area. Why do you think they haven't come through us? I'm stuffed if I know. We were talking about it before you came in. Perhaps they think there's more of us than there is. Perhaps they're waiting for more guns or tanks or something. Though I think they've got more than enough for us little lot without waiting for more. Gorman looked at the back of Lydon's fair head. Both men were fair, both Yorkshiremen. Lydon, tall and big-boned, more typically Saxon than Mocock, who was shorter and thicker. Lydon was slower in speech than his friend, and this gave the impression that he was slower thinking. Gorman knew this wasn't true. He wondered what the big man thought about it, and he asked, What do you think, Dell? Do you think they're waiting for reinforcements? No, they're waiting for guts. I think 1st and 4th Brigades frighten the daylights out of the bastards, and they're hoping we'll get too stuffing thirsty and too stuffing hungry and too stuffing tired to fight anymore. They're hoping we'll run out of stuffing ammo. I expect they've been hoping we'd walk into the bag like those stuffers did at Singapore and Tobruk. Lydon turned and looked at Gorman, and his last words he spat out. They're going to drop a bollock, aren't they, Sarge? It wasn't the men's fault at Singapore and Tobruk, Dell. In both cases, the surrender was made at the highest level. Highest level, bollocks. No man had surrendered troops who had the guts to go on fighting. Gorman laughed and got to his feet. You might be right at that, but I'll leave you to sort it out. I'm going to have a look at Cummings. He met Bridgman and his runner as soon as he got through the back door, but it was a second or two before he recognised the men with them. Hello, Frank, I've got some reinforcements for you. Bridgman was grinning. I thought I'd take a look in the hospital and these chaps wouldn't let me leave without them. Bilting wanted to come too, but one of the docs says he's got a fever, so I had to leave him behind. Gorman looked beyond Bridgman to where Fraser, Hardy and Butcher stood, trying to look as if they were there by chance. Butcher's left arm was in a sling, and both Hardy's and Fraser's heads were bandaged. Are they all for me? Gorman, raising his eyebrow in inquiry. Hardy and Butcher both belong to Blake, don't they? Yes, but you're the thinnest on the ground. I thought I'd give you Fraser, who's one of your chaps anyway, and Hardy as well. With two extra men, you should be able to conduct some sort of reliefs. I'll take Butcher back to Blake. He can only use one hand, but we'll be able to find something for him to do. Cummings had been on his own for some time, so Gorman told him to rest in an upstairs bedroom and put Hardy and Fraser in his place. He outlined the situation of the rest of the company, then left them to return to Murray and find out how far he had progressed with the tank trap. When he'd gone, Fraser said, You'll have to man that bloody thing. He nodded towards the Spandau. I'm afraid I never paid much attention when Nash was teaching us how to handle them. If the damn thing jammed, I shouldn't have a clue. Anyway, you were Blake's crack Bren gunner, weren't you? Hardy grinned wryly and sank behind the Spandau, wincing as a movement of his neck started his head throbbing. It was typical of Roy Fraser that he should not know how to operate the German gun. His attitude of couldn't care less was something deeper than a mere pose. Hardy thought he was generally not particularly interested in the outcome of the war, or even the particular battle they were fighting at that moment. It was impossible to get his friend to talk seriously on any subject except cricket or tennis, and yet he never shirked a job or sought to avoid anything because it happened to be dangerous. He took everything in his calm, unruffled stride, seeming to affect affectation for the pleasure of infuriating others. Hardy watched Murray and three of his men carrying armfuls of Hawkins mines up the road and disappear into a garden on the left of it. He thought they were chancing their arm a bit, and he watched the three houses at the end closely. Fraser slumped down with his back to the wall beside him. His voice carried its usual trace of condescending banter. I'd like to wager that Tom Marsden will be across as soon as he hears that we're back. He won't miss the opportunity of taking the piss out of his wounded heroes, will he? I can almost hear him now. And the Battle of Arnhem was lost on the playing fields of Eton. Hardy laughed quietly. He liked Marsden, and he knew Fraser did as well. He also knew that Tom got under Roy's skin in a way that nobody else could. His continual references to gentlemen rankers came as near to upsetting Fraser's poise as anything Hardy had seen. Suddenly, without thinking, he asked a question that neither had ever asked the other. Tell me, Roy, why didn't you go to OCTU? You must have had the chance. He felt Fraser's eyes on him and turned his head from the window. They looked at each other for a moment, then instead of answering, Fraser asked, Why didn't you? 
Hardy looked back up the road. Because I'm a bastard. Well, we all know that, and a very conscientious bastard too. No, I, I'm serious. I turned down the chance of going to OCTU but because I'm a bastard. I've never met my father. I haven't the faintest idea who he is. It's as simple as that. Fraser said nothing for a long minute, but sat with his lips pursed. When he did speak, the tone of his voice was unchanged. It expressed neither sympathy nor understanding, nor surprise. I don't see what that has to do with it. I should think you could put what you like on those bloody forms. You don't seriously think they've time to check every application for OCTU, do you? No, but you have to provide a birth certificate. Even so, I can't see that it would have made any difference. With the country at war, I can't see that a war office selection board would be concerned about the legitimacy or otherwise of a candidate's birth. Perhaps not, but the whole thing would have been brought out into the open. Other people would have had to know. I always felt it would be like betraying my mother for a personal advantage. Anyway, there it is. That's why I never went to OCTU. What about you? I didn't go because I didn't want to. There was no particular reason. I just didn't want to. Fraser got up and walked to the door. I'm going to have a mosey around. See if there's any grub about. If they have a bash, don't be greedy. Save some for me. And he was gone into the passage, leaving Hardy no wiser than before. This didn't worry him much. He hadn't initiated the conversation out of curiosity. He wasn't really curious about Fraser's reasons. He'd wanted an excuse to give his own, and now that he had, he felt a small measure of contentment. It hadn't been so hard as he had thought it would be. Perhaps now, if he got back, he might be able to tell Sybil, and who knows, she might take it as casually as Roy had. Hardy saw Murray and his men come out into the road again, Walk, Bannum and Waterson. The way they walked, with their weapons half raised to their shoulders, would have seemed melodramatic at any other time. They faced up the road towards the houses at the end, and Hardy sensed how their eyes must be probing, searching for any sign of movement. Murray followed them, paying out a makeshift line made up of curtaining and sheets. There was little hope of concealing their object from the enemy, and it didn't matter just so long as armour was stopped from coming down the road. A single rifle shot rang out, and Hardy saw Waterson stagger sideways as if he'd been pushed suddenly and caught off balance. He heard the brain in the house above him open fire a fraction of a second before his own finger closed round the trigger. Then both sections were pouring fire into the three houses at the end of the road and into the spaces around them. From the corner of his eye, Hardy saw Waterson continue down the road towards him, his back to the enemy. The other two men had jumped and half started to run back. They had both checked themselves and turned to face the direction from which the shot had come. Murray continued to play out the line, and then it was stuck, caught up in something out of sight in the garden. Murray pulled frantically at it. Failing to free it, he dropped the part he held and ran back to where it disappeared around a gatepost. Walk and Bannum had moved onto the pavement on the right of the road. Bannum lay against a garden wall, and Walk knelt behind him. Neither of them had fired. They were leaving covering fire to the sections behind them. Instead, they watched for any movement their weapons held loosely at their shoulders. Murray reappeared, running fast. He stooped to pick up the line where he had dropped it in the middle of the road, and even as he picked it up, he was hit. He sprawled rather than fell, like a soccer player who had overreached himself in an attempt to get the ball. Almost at once, he was on his feet again, and stumbling in a series of hops across the road. He dropped a three-foot circle of rope over the gatepost, and then passed his cloth line through it. He shouted to Walk and Bannum, and the three fell back together, Murray paying out the line as he went. Hardy saw it all between the space bursts he was putting about the houses at the end of the road. He had spotted no movement there, and it was likely the shots had come from the leading scout of a patrol. He ceased firing the moment Murray and his men got out of sight at the farthest of the two houses. He looked at Fraser, who had come into the room and now lay alongside him. Within minutes, an hour or two at the most, the Germans would be facing them in force. They would be separated from them by only 80 or so yards of open road. Without warning, Fraser started to laugh, really to laugh, his shoulders shaking. I wonder, he said, I wonder what the Germans would do if they realised that there were only 25 men between themselves and our divisional headquarters. Hardy looked back out of the window and wondered if the makeshift line would run freely through the rope loop, whether it would in fact drag the mines across the road when they were needed. I found some bottled green peas. I'll go and get them. Fraser got up and went out again.